it makes you feel like kind of, I don't know, embarrassed or something to be like a late bloomer. Like, you know, it makes me feel like I'm like coming into my breast buds again. <laughs> it took you a hot minute to realize you were queer. M's a straight one. I'm like, okay, ally. You had a threesome with another woman, mm. but you were like, I'm not queer. With the two women. Okay. <laughs> but this is not going to be your last pride Maybe. throughout the year. That's a threat. Ooh. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Queer Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Carbon. I'm Emily. I'm Ralph. I'm Eva. And welcome to the show. And this podcast is presented by Vizzy Hard Seltzer and Field, but more on that later. Coming out later in life can be a nerve-wracking yet exhilarating experience. From navigating intense feelings for a queer first love to imposter syndrome, we're going to cover it all. And to do it, we have two very special guests joining us today. So our first guest is Eva Bloom, who you may recognize from our previous episode, The Queer and Trans Sex Ed You Deserved, but but never got. And Eva is a queer sex educator and public speaker who you can find on socials at What's My Body Doing? Thank you, Eva, for joining the show. Thanks so much for having me back. I'm so excited to be back. Our next guest is Ralph, who is a queer singer-songwriter here in Toronto, whose music you should absolutely stream if you're looking for a new sapphic pop diva. Ralph has recently come into her queerness and is here today to share her personal experiences and insight alongside Eva's invaluable theory and advice. So thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. Eva, to ground this conversation, can you first explain the term queer late bloomers and what that really means? So late bloomer is kind of a vague term. It can mean Mm -hmm. a lot of different things to different people. When I talk about it, I usually say like, it took you a hot minute to realize you were queer. (laughs) I feel like people also talk about missing milestones. Like maybe you didn't go through your high school as your authentic self. Maybe you didn't get to go through college as your authentic self. Maybe you even like had a marriage where you Mm -hmm. went through not as your authentic self and kind of that process of grief and reclamation later in life. the term late bloomer like feels validating for that experience, then mm. it is yours yeah. to use. <laughs> What's the average age span of late bloomer? I would say like maybe late 20s and beyond that. And Ralph, when did you come into enlightenment? Hmm. <laughs> it's funny, as you were yeah. speaking, Eva, I was like thinking about it because my first hookup ever was with a girl when ever? I was, yeah, when I was in grade eight. It was my first time getting drunk. It was her first time getting drunk. She was my best friend. We drank a bunch of my parents' random alcohol. They were out for the night. We just ended up like full-blown making out on the bed. Tops came off. It was like heated. It wasn't like Mm -hmm. a kiss. Yeah. It was like, we're in it. I don't know if I was in love with her or Mm. if I was infatuated with her, but I was definitely very obsessed with her. So I think that there definitely was something more than just a friendship, obviously. (laughs) Um, (laughs) However, the next morning when we woke up, she just pretended that she couldn't remember a thing. I mean, we were young and she came from religion and she stopped talking to me and I never spoke to her again. So my like queer awakening kind of got like crushed a little. I tucked that away. And then I have two brothers and my older brother was, you know, he always had guys around and I just became kind of the opposite. Very guy obsessed. And in high school, Mm. it was, you know, my brother's friends were always around and they were like, it's hot sister. And I was like, I love male attention. Mm. And I didn't really think about the other side of the coin. I was dating someone for quite a while and I was hooking up with women occasionally during that and I would ask his permission and I guess we'd never spoken about like what that what meant because not like he was there he wasn't in the room yeah, with us yeah, so yeah. I'd be like I go make out with this girl <laughs> yeah. that should have been assigned to him but I like came out to him and I thought that he knew that I was queer because I'd been hooking up with women and right. then I casually mm. said to him yeah you know I'm wondering if I should post about being bi and he was like whoa what and I was like wait mm, you're what? bi yeah we, yeah <laughs> He was shocked. And I actually, I, I, I felt kind of bad because I was like, I'd said it so casually mm-hmm. and he was shocked. He was like, I didn't know that. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I thought you knew that. <laughs> to be fair, like, I think there was, you know, issues in the relationship and he could sense that I was kind of like one foot out the door. We'd broken fair. up a couple times. Yeah, yeah. So I think he was like, oh, great. Another threat. But I tucked away that coming out mm. as announcement for mm. another, oh, I don't know, a couple of years. Yeah. Every time you like kept getting kind of like yeah. stopped mm-hmm. and suppressed. Did you ever feel shame? from like that first instance that you talked about or the second? You know, I only this year was talking to my girlfriend about the makeout incident when I was young and I had never really thought of it as like feeling shame Mm. or guilt but I think that there's a lot of stuff connected to that that I've never really acknowledged. Mm. Mm. I think it's like a small trauma where Mm. I kind of had this big thing. I felt like turned on. I felt connected Mm. and then to have someone be like, I don't know what you're talking about Mm. and and to have no one to talk to about it because that was my best friend. I was just like, oh, 
oh, I did something wrong. Oh, mm-hmm. I took advantage. Oh, and then she never spoke to me again. I think mm-hmm. I felt really guilty. It's like a breakup with no closure too. Yeah. Which is mm-hmm. really sure. intense. So I think that there was things that maybe internally were a little voice in my head that was like, you're not going to do that again. Don't do that again. Yeah. That didn't go well. Yeah, and it was negative reinforcement. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I, I kind of pivoted and went completely the opposite direction, which brought its own dramas, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, dating yeah. like guys forever, ever. It's, it's like you were saying, it's a huge piece that a lot of people look at is like, do I just enjoy male validation mm-hmm. or do I actually enjoy hooking up with men? For sure. Because I think just the way that our society socializes us, a lot of people who are AFAB don't really learn, I guess, to be the pursuer. And then like you don't yeah. get that same kind of validation all the time, which yeah. is like a bit of a roadblock. Definitely. Initially, when we first started dating me and my girlfriend, I'd be like, well, I'm so used to guys doing this and guys doing this. And she'd mm-hmm. go, okay, but I don't really do that. So yeah. we're going to have to kind of figure it out. Who's the pursuer? Who's the initiator? Yeah. Who's the person who has the toolbox? <laughs> Quite literally. Yeah, it's man. me in case you're wondering. Yeah. <laughs> but like creating dynamics that yeah. exist outside of like a cis hetero predator prey. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. this can actually exist on more of like an even playing field totally. or like we can create new yeah. ways of existing. I think even us having this past year opened up our relationship and I've explored my bisexuality too and dating men from the perspective of a queer lens has mm. been like really mind boggling too <gasps> because I'm like you don't have to be all of these things and it actually takes away a lot of these like heteronormative standards from it. That relationship actually like feels a lot better than all of these past relationships where I felt like yeah. I was like needing to be in this box and I'm like no I'm just going to show up as myself in sure. the ways that I've taken all of these gender roles for the past like <laughs> six years of our relationship out of ours. I'm like mm-hmm. I'm not going to throw those back on myself you know. Mm-hmm. I would say you came out hot actually. You'd be like, like can you handle this now? <laughs> Full of knowledge. Like, <laughs> honestly, that's yeah. amazing to like enter yeah. into a relationship being like, so I know myself really well. I know yeah. what my boundaries are. I know how to communicate and I know how I want to be communicated yes. with. If that works for you, great. If not, bye. That comes with years of being in, you know, a relationship that works for you to be able to like harness those. Yeah. And I mean, there's only a few people who can handle yeah. that type of human. And like, there's really a way to weed people out. Yes. I would say. Eva, what's the most common reasons or mm-hmm. maybe even narrowed down to a single reason? as to why somebody might experience that suppression of queerness and be a late bloomer. A couple of things came up as you were like sharing your story. I feel like one of them is just like the minimization of women and like AFAB people's sexuality and like mm-hmm. autonomy. The idea of you can just hook up with girls and it's not like a real thing yeah. that relates yeah. to our yeah. sexuality. Yeah. Either it's like totally. for fun or it's mm-hmm. just hot that yeah. that doesn't equate to like being bi mm-hmm. or yeah. like being queer. Mm-hmm. And so you don't integrate that into who you are versus I feel like this narrative for queer men is very much the opposite direction maybe in a way oh that's God, also like, harmful so toxic you do it once and that's who you are, you are gay. there's no flexibility you are gay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which yeah. is also like not true like they're also yeah. bi yeah. men they're fluid men yeah. like yeah. let's create expansiveness there just really like the lack of representation I feel like I talk about that so much especially for us growing up yeah. like the most common queer representations for like mm-hmm. queer women were like Ellen and like yeah. Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> yeah. totally. and oftentimes those women are portrayed in like a joke like to be like the butt of the joke we really didn't get any positive Mm -hmm. representation of being queer Mm -hmm. is like beautiful being queer is like sexy being queer Mm -hmm. is like you're a whole human being and you can like live and like have help your relationships people take you people take you seriously people can take you seriously you can have a normal job yeah yeah (laughs) and like it's like not a big deal Mm -hmm. so when you have no examples of what Mm -hmm. that can look like for you you're like well I'm not Ellen I'm not Rosie O'Donnell (laughs) seeing yourself as like 13 being obsessed with your best friend yeah. you're like that doesn't map on to anything I'm seeing anywhere especially I feel like I still am like quite femme like I really yeah. loved like mm-hmm. fashion and I loved to like straighten my hair and I was like yeah. blonde and I had side bangs I didn't look at those people and go okay yeah, yeah that feels right for me right. you know mm-hmm. I was looking at like Rachel from Friends and being like well that feels right for me yeah, yeah. yeah. dang you know yeah. 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 pretty straight <laughs> <laughs> there are like a lot of femme movies and stuff but all of that is so through the male gaze mm-hmm. yeah. where it doesn't feel like that's an authentic yeah queer experience again that feeds into the idea mm-hmm. that it's like just a sexual thing yeah it's always just girls best friends making out mm-hmm. in tank tops and being like oh my god 
that, you yeah. know? Yeah, and you're like, okay, I guess that's not a big deal. Then yeah. I guess I just like to make out with yeah. my friends. Yeah, because they never talk about it being anything more than just a kiss. Yeah, or even as like a joke, like, haha, mm-hmm. we made it in yeah. college, but yeah. Or for, for someone else. Yeah. yeah. So if it's yeah. more than a kiss. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if it's for me. What if it's for me? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know And I do. feel something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what does I, that mean? Yeah. 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 We're tingling. Yeah. yeah. We're tingling. Tingles are happening. For sure. I feel like for so long, like, there really was this, like, angry lesbian stereotype mm. or mm. that, like, there was something dirty or wrong mm-hmm. about being, like, a queer woman. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's only until very recently mm-hmm. that we've seen positive representation. Yeah. 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 Well, I think in my experience when I was growing up, my interpretation of seeing a lesbian or a queer woman mm-hmm. was, like, they are less of a woman now. That yeah. kept me from wanting to be curious. Because um, yeah. I was like, well, I don't want to be less of a woman. I was fed all of these narratives of what mm-hmm. that means and I'm still now mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. trying to unlearn it and like redefine what that means to me. You'll notice a lot in the community it's like a lot of femmes are always with masks or mm-hmm. like it's very rare that you're going to find like a femme mask loving on femme. Mask. Mask, mask on mask. mask. Yeah. mask. Yeah. I'm ready for the mask on mask. Yeah. But that's a huge piece of it too is like not seeing yourself in it. You don't see I don't know if your friend in high school was also a femme as well. Yeah quite femme. But yeah but like and a lot of my crushes have been quite femme. Yeah but mm-hmm. you're not seeing any of those representations of like these like femme loving femme relationships it's actually so rare to see that yeah and when you do it's so under the male gaze i also mm-hmm. wonder if because i was hooking up with people but i wasn't even like oh i'm queer mm-hmm. i wasn't even thinking about like okay what are the quintessential queer dynamics okay like femme and mask mm-hmm. like i was just hooking up with whoever i was attracted yeah. to whoever got and the bits tingling yeah exactly <laughs> i wasn't confined yeah. by the, the the norm you know yeah. i feel like that was it for me like i had a full like full queer threesome like <laughs> fully thought i was straight like it wasn't until i realized i had romantic feelings that yeah. i was like oh that is definitely queer i can't like right. do mm. the math in my brain to be like oh it's just sexual that doesn't count right. it's like a mental backflip you're trying to do it's like no i still can be in this box <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like sexual like doesn't count unless i develop feelings mm-hmm. right that's when, what i was gonna say is it's interesting that like you had a threesome with another woman mm-hmm. but you were like i'm not queer like I, with two women okay <laughs> <laughs> oh my. and you were like <laughs> And no you were dicks. Like, this is not queer. I am a heterosexual. I'm I've been I'm flirting with these people ally. beforehand. <laughs> the mental gymnastics. Yes, the for way sure. that we minimize. For sure. Yeah. I feel like too, I don't know, if you're listening at home, if you've had sexual experiences with other yeah. queer people that felt aligned, that you felt excited about, that counts. You're queer enough. Hundred <laughs> percent. I think you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> not to welcome, give you an yeah. existential crisis whenever yeah. you're listening to this, but consider you're welcome in the club if you want to be in yeah. the club. One thing I wanted to ask as well, we noticed that on your story, Eva, you posted a poll of like how people feel about the term queer late bloomer. Mm -hmm. And there was like mixed reviews. Mm. So I first wanted to ask you, Ralph, because like Mm. literally this whole podcast, we're like, you're a queer late bloomer. (laughs) Yeah. How do you feel about that? Well, it's funny you should ask because right before I came here, I was talking with my girlfriend and Mm -hmm. she was like, oh, queer late bloomer. Okay. Do you feel like that (laughs) relates to you? And I was like, "Uh, it kind of rubs me the same way as like baby gay, which I Mm. don't love either. Mm. Baby gay feels like a little patronizing just Mm. personally. Mm -hmm. I don't love it for me personally because I I came out publicly as queer mm. recently, but I'd known personally and in my friend groups and even mm. in my family, like it had been something that I was always kind of like, I mm. like anybody, you know? Everyone. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I do. I, I you know, yeah. I think sometimes bi isn't even really, for me, that feels like too binary. Yeah. But I respect the term and I get it and mm-hmm. I do fall into it because I mm-hmm. did start, you know, living my truth as a queer person mm. in my late 20s, early 30s. I think that, and I can only speak for myself, but it makes you feel like kind of, I don't know embarrassed or something to be like a late bloomer like you know it makes me feel like I'm like coming into my breast buds again (laughs) (laughs) baby's first training bra but Eva would you be able to kind of like recap what the results were on that poll what other people were thinking about it and how you feel about it too because you're doing lots of like workshops and and calling people Mm -hmm. queer late bloomer so what do you think yeah Mm -hmm. I think it really surprised me how absolutely all over the place Mm -hmm. it was there are people being like yeah it feels infantilizing it feels like it maybe diminishes my experience there was a reply that was like I can't be late like I'm on my own timing Mm -hmm. I love that Mm -hmm. I feel like everybody's experience is valid 
good. And Mm -hmm. whether you know when you're six Mm -hmm. or you know like when you're 30 or 40, Mm -hmm. like it doesn't really matter. The point is that you know. I know for myself it felt very helpful to find community, Mm -hmm. especially coming out as a lesbian felt like a big jump Mm -hmm. (laughs) to me, like especially over the pandemic and doing Mm -hmm. a lot of that like exploration and rethinking by myself to talk to other people to be like, oh, we're also like Mm -hmm. recontextualizing. We're thinking about compulsory heterosexuality together and it helped me feel less Mm -hmm. alone. So yeah, I would say that would be some of the positives that people said too. I mean, I think I can resonate with both, like being someone Mm -hmm. who would say I experienced that. It's like, yeah, I think you're never late. Like your experience is your experience, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think like that's Mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. But in comparison to other people, like I did find out later in life, you know, and that does add to my experience. It's not something I would add to my like list of identity cards. Like I wouldn't be like, hi, I'm a queer late bloomer (laughs) to everyone I'm meeting. You know, but I'm like, like in, <laughs> yeah, in the context of Just this podcast. Just here, late. <laughs> yeah. 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 She, her, late. Uh, yeah. She, her, late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like in the context of this podcast or you running workshops, like it's somewhere people can meet others who have a similar experience. You just True. can't deny the fact that it's like some people know when they're sex. Like Carbon, you knew like when you were sex kind of. I wouldn't say I knew, but I had a hint. <laughs> I had An inkling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at some movie posters in a little retrospect. Bit too long. <laughs> yeah. In reality, I didn't know until like 19. Really. Okay. Yeah. But for yeah. me, that's yeah. still like yeah. not super early. I had no effing clue though. Like yeah. I was watching yeah. porn, <laughs> yeah. only looking at the girl. I was like, ew. Anytime it would be like a close up on the guy, I'm like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> Even like I like guys too, but I'm yeah. just like I, I don't know. In my head, I'm like, no, this is super straight. I don't yeah. know. I'm like, I'm like, no, no, it's okay. I'm pretending I'm the girl. I'm like, no, you're mm. you're thinking about fucking her. Mm-hmm. Like, you're looking at the things she's doing, and you <laughs> wish she was doing them to you. Yeah. Like, bro, why are you watching straight <laughs> porn right now? <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. Everyone like started coming out on my rugby team too, and then that's when I <laughs> actually <laughs> rugby. It's and another. the shoes are here, and she played <laughs> rugby. So everybody's coming out of my rugby. Team yeah. and I was like, why am I the only straight person on the team? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the thing was though, it's like that's when I started realizing and then I started seeing them dating each other because that's the representation mm. that I wasn't yeah. seeing. I was like, oh, two people who were previously friends and women are now dating and they're having a great time. And then I started mm. like longing for that. Um. And that's when I started realizing, but it was like a very painted experience of people being like, I'm the straight one. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And then I was like, okay, I'm in this box. No one ever asked and was like, mm-hmm. do you like girls too? It was like, no, you're our straight friend. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'll lie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's really hard when people put you in the box. It takes a yeah. lot of courage, yeah. especially if you're, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but like yeah. if you are in a hetero relationship to then yeah. be like, well, actually, I'm, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just, it's, it's, I, yeah, it happened to me a lot too. I feel like it ties into the biphobia too and like mm. bi erasure as well, where mm. it's like, yeah, I'm in this hetero presenting relationship and I wasn't like totally unhappy with it, but I didn't know that meant that I could be in both and totally. enjoy both. Like it felt very binary to me. I'm like, I have to be gay or I have to be yeah. straight. People just kind of like assigned it to you too. Based on, I guess, like the the limited knowledge they had, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. based on the fact that they were like, okay, so you're dating a guy, you're straight. And you were yeah. like, oh, yeah, totally. Guess, well, that's, that's what that means. Yeah. Yeah. I think coming out as bi, if you are in a straight passing relationship, yeah. it means nothing to anybody. Yes. So you're like, you're bi, but you're dating a guy, so you're straight. It yeah. doesn't matter. It feels like you need mm-hmm. receipts or proof. Yes. That's yeah. the thing mm-hmm. too. It's so like, much. look so, at all the things I've done, but yeah. like, <laughs> but look at my porn history. <laughs> I promise. (laughs) When I was in LA a little while ago, I was... Trying to say this in a way that will not give anything away. <laughs> yeah, keep, I was in a secrets. room with a bunch of queer people, mm. and a couple of them are in a very well-known band, mm. and I respect them very much as people and as musicians. I was dating a guy, mm. and they were all talking about being queer, and they were like, "Ugh, bi people," mm. and they were like, "Bi celebrities always end up with a guy." They had no idea. I, everyone mm. thought I was straight, and I was not about to be like, "Actually, mm-hmm. actually, <laughs> you're talking about me, bitch." Shut no, <laughs> but I remember I respected everyone in that room so much and um, there were such strong queer representatives that to have them be like you know yep. it's just such a shame mm-hmm. that a lot of the women in mm-hmm. media who come out as bi end up with guys they kind of mm-hmm. take the easy route where they get to you know have kids in the sort of standard way they were like it's just unfortunate that stayed with me yeah, yeah because yeah. I was like you guys are such strong advocates for the queer mm-hmm. community and I really respect that and I just mm-hmm. feel like if you're saying it then like well, fuck me you know yeah. in order for you to say something back to that you had to be 
showing otherwise exactly. and you weren't I had, in that I moment. I had no receipts. I had nothing. I had, you know, made out with some gals and I just felt like I could not this use is a that. common sentiment, I think. Yes. I don't know if you feel this way, mm -hmm. but I've even felt this way of like, it's such a shame that majority of bisexual women end up with guys because mm -hmm. it's like the easier route. Yeah. I have felt that sentiment and I'm guilty of it for sure. Yeah. I'm not proud of necessarily having that sentiment. I'm not even entirely sure where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like, what do you think? <laughs> I think it's <laughs> actually help me therapy. <laughs> no. I feel like it's very much like I'm mad at the system. Mm -hmm. Like I'm mad at cis heteropatriarchy, mm -hmm. which gives queer women and like bi women five billion movies about straight romance mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. it gives one movie about queer romance. Mm -hmm. I channel that <laughs> feeling of I wish more bi people like got to experience the joys of queer intimacy if, mm -hmm. and relationships if that's what they want. And I know that like the way for more bi people to experience that is to create more normalization, more representation, mm -hmm. and to really celebrate all bi people in yeah. all of their journey mm -hmm. to even give the permission to like claim a queer mm -hmm. identity at all. That's the thing though. I mean, even tying back to your story, it's what I found, especially being in a queer presenting relationship for the past five, almost six almost years six. now, is that it happens on both sides. There's a lot of pressure, I'd say, once you're locked in this relationship to be like, no, now I'm a lesbian. It's mm -hmm. like, it's okay, yeah. I'm a lesbian. Yeah. I'm yeah. one of you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, one of, I'm you. one of you now. Yeah. Because otherwise, other people feel uncomfortable by it. It feels like you're not like part of the community enough. One thing I, I realized too was like coming into my bisexuality this past like year is that it did like make a lot of my friends uncomfortable too. Like mm -hmm. a lot of them were like, "Whoa, like I saw you as a lesbian, and now I'm like yeah. really thrown off by it." Yeah, and it's like <laughs> they love me. Like they were like, "It's okay, like I'm getting over it." But it was like something I had to deal with in my <laughs> yeah. head, and I'm like, it's "Like it's like your it. inner struggle." It's almost like a little betrayal or something where they're That's like, what it felt "Whoa." Like for them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that same pressure. It would feel really scary if ever, theoretically speaking, we weren't together and mm -hmm. suddenly yeah. I was like, I'm actually dating a guy. I would get so spirally and anxious about people being like, imposter. You know what it is, though, that I will yeah. say that's helped me get over it is that piece of, like, realizing, like, no, this is still a queer relationship. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. like, making sure, like, my other partner knows that I'm, like, this is queer. Like, and he's also queer himself, yeah. too, which is, like, a piece that I find also very comforting was finding also, like, a queer man. I was going to ask man. you if you if that was a part of what you seek in, in men. It definitely, 100%. Yeah. That piece helped me where I'm, like, no, in, like, standing firm in your own bisexuality, too, and being, like, mm -hmm. I can be a queer community organizer, someone mm -hmm. who's, like, making this content and I'm like I am bisexual in saying that I feel like it like creates better representation rather than I don't know it actually like erases that representation of like oh someone who is a bisexual woman can end up in a relationship with mm -hmm. a woman mm -hmm. you know what I mean mm -hmm. which was like exactly what they were saying doesn't happen yes. but like if we didn't open up our relationship I would just be like another number that they would probably call a lesbian yeah. you know what I mean yeah, yeah. but it's like those numbers do exist I think we just like don't see them because we're erasing them I think it's too about like shifting your understanding of bisexuality from like who you're dating and like your mm -hmm. external mm -hmm. actions to like mm -hmm. bisexuality and all queerness is like an intentional identity. Like yeah, mm -hmm. you are bringing your queer politic, yeah. your queer idea to like yeah. every single relationship you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like that's the same for all queer people. Like you yeah. can be a bi woman married to a man and mm -hmm. like you can like queer that mm -hmm. dynamic. You can exist in a queer way politically in terms of mm -hmm. advocacy. I don't know, in terms mm -hmm. of like queer culture and mm -hmm. fashion and style. I think it's so beautiful to like be a bi woman in a relationship with a man mm -hmm. and existing in that like solidarity and like queering the world around us like I think that's so totally. fucking sick and that's amazing for anybody listening to hear you say that mm -hmm. we get so in our heads about this imposter syndrome of you mm -hmm. know am I queer enough if you are and you feel mm -hmm. those feelings then that's yeah. all you need to know a huge part of the argument that I think is valid kind of against bisexuality mm -hmm. not against, against it but just, <laughs> just like stepping up to the table <laughs> the, the feelings <laughs> of resentment of being like you have the option to be in this very straight passing relationship mm -hmm. you have the option to like right. have kids in a very easy way yeah. to walk through the world as like straight cis people and not be judged not face the type of experiences that you would as like a mask lesbian mm -hmm. you know when you're like walking through the world and I think that's kind of like the obligation I would say that bisexual people it's not an obligation but I find it as an obligation personally mm -hmm. is like if you're wanting to exist in the community it's like taking the good with the bad as well mm -hmm. 
Well, if you are in this straight passing relationship, it's like finding ways to still like express your queerness. And like, even if you don't have these receipts, still telling people, I think is like an act of resistance. There's like a lot of power in mm-hmm. being like, I am going to go to this queer event because I am yeah. queer. 100% because lesbians and gay men, like you don't get to choose. And it's mm-hmm. true. And like, mm-hmm. you really do have to be visible. You do have to walk in these spaces. Mm-hmm. That is the easy piece about bisexuality. But I'm yeah. interested to know your thoughts. Carter. True. Hold that thought because this podcast is proudly sponsored by Vizzy Hard Seltzer. That's right. And the ones that we were drinking in this episode is from their new launch, which is Vizzy Hard Seltzer Max, now with 7% alcohol. And they have vibrant new flavors like papaya pineapple, dragon fruit mango, blueberry white peach, and passion fruit kiwi. Love it. And they all taste super good. And as always, we recommend if you are a hard seltzer drinker that you support a brand that you know also supports the queer community. These past seven months, we've been having a really incredible time exploring ethical non-monogamy in our own relationship because we're dating. And a huge catalyst for this change has genuinely been exploring things on Field. For those of you who don't know, Field is a dating app geared towards polyamory, ethical non-monogamy, and kink. If this sounds like something you're interested in exploring, we definitely recommend downloading Field. That's F-E-E-L-D. And And now, now, back back to to the episode. episode. I have so many conflicting thoughts. I've been battling myself the whole time. Mm. I have feelings, Mm. but then I have reality Mm -hmm. (laughs) and things I know to be true. Mm And they conflict. And I'll be very honest. Like yeah, I've please. shared the sentiment of the feelings of betrayal. Mm. I have felt feelings like when Emily started dating men as we opened up our relationship, I was kind of just like waiting for it to end. Mm. Mm. I was like, when are you, can you just get your like fix, fix your yeah. kick out of the way? And then like, can we focus on women again? Cause like, that's my comfort zone. Yeah. And like, I don't know what to do mm. here. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm mm-hmm. like, my whole world is being shaken up. I felt the feelings of betrayal, even though I know that not to be true. It still was a feeling that came up for me and I had to really work on that and like work through it yeah. and be like, okay, this is who you are. It's not a phase. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Similar to how yeah. when girls start dating yeah. other girls, yeah. it's, like it's not yeah. a phase. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just your truth. It's your reality. And unconditional love means accepting every part of you. Mm-hmm. Even the things that aren't convenient for me. It's a huge fear. I think that a lot mm-hmm. of lesbians share mm-hmm. that I don't want you to leave me for a man. Because right. for me specifically, mm-hmm. that makes me feel in fear. Right. Mm. Because the societal standard is that a man dates a woman. Yeah. So if you leave me for a man, it's like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and you're like, you're like the other. You're like other yeah. in that moment. And yeah. you're like, okay, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't yeah. worth yeah. like the risk. To- yeah. I wasn't worth the risk. Mm-hmm. I wasn't worth like yeah. you being more visibly queer. I yeah. wasn't worth, you know, or the like, difficulties of, the diff- of being in a, yeah. in a non hetero relationship. Totally. You know, yeah. And like with Fair. this person, now you can just like pass. Yeah. And now you can have it easier and I won't. That. I know it not to be true, especially in our case case yeah like yeah. emily like with fucking queer like the podcast you know yeah. what i mean like she's yeah. her life is queer yeah and like yeah she works so hard to fully like create space be queer be out mm-hmm. and like let everybody know mm-hmm. so it's like why am i holding a grudge i think it's really powerful to talk about the different experiences of lesbians and bi people because mm-hmm. i think fundamentally those are different experiences and yeah. the more we don't talk about it sure. and the more that we pretend that it's the same i feel mm-hmm. like it's easier for these resentments to come up as mm-hmm. opposed to being like there are different experiences within Mm -hmm. the queer community. We have different privileges. We have different Mm -hmm. things that are maybe challenging Mm -hmm. and we can still show each other solidarity even though we exist and move in these like different ways. I don't like making generalizations, but literally every lesbian we know feels this way. Genuinely, I have not met a lesbian that doesn't feel like some sense of like insecurity in that way. But the interesting thing is like Mm -hmm. on the other end, men feel the same way too. When they're dating a bisexual, they're like scared that you're going to leave them for a woman <laughs> who knows your body better because they have the same yeah. body parts like it's totally. it happens like totally. on both sides all the time it never feels like that doesn't exist there is a sense that <laughs> yeah. bi people have privilege yeah. because right. they can mm-hmm. be mm-hmm. in a queer relationship and they can kind of be a part of this amazing gorgeous community and then they can also at any moment go back to yeah. being Code in a straight switch. passing yeah, if, yeah if it's easier so I think mm-hmm. there's a sense and I'm not saying that that's the reality but I mm-hmm. think that sometimes there is a sense of privilege that goes along with being bi and having the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Hannah so, Montana. <laughs> can I share like, I don't know, my perspective as a lesbian who doesn't hold mm-hmm. yeah. these yes, like please. Please. Yeah. things. Thank you. <laughs> For me, I don't know, as like a non-binary person mm-hmm. yeah. and also like being interested in non-binary and trans people, mm-hmm. yeah. it doesn't feel like that mm-hmm. same like, oh, 
are you going to go back to like men or women? I'm like, we're all just like in this Mm -hmm. together. (laughs) I definitely feel the same way. I think my perspective around relationships and like bodies as well, just being like, it really, it Mm -hmm. actually doesn't matter to me what kind of genitals you have, any of that. I'm like, just vibes. I'm just attracted to your essence, which I mean, like that might mean I'm pansexual. In my understanding, pansexuality is an idea of attraction regardless of gender. Whether you're a man, woman, not binary, that doesn't like opt you in or out or I don't have like a preference in terms of gender yeah. versus bisexuality in my understanding is attraction to multiple genders. Mm-hmm. So that can be mm-hmm. men, women, non-binary people or gender plays a war- role where you're like, I'm attracted to you mm-hmm. and part of that is because of your gender. The more I've explored my own gender and have like gotten like more curious about being non-binary myself too, it's like I've realized that yeah, like bodies don't matter at all and that is what has helped me unpack it. I was just thinking about this as you were speaking and I was like, I don't know if something to share or if it's just something that's in my brain. Right now, I I actually feel like dating a woman has been so healing for me mm-hmm. yeah. and I'm actually so unattracted to men because mm-hmm. I had so much physicality trauma mm-hmm. and obligatory sex and physicality yeah. in my relationships with men. Mm-hmm. At least this is how my brain perceived mm-hmm. physicality with a man a lot of the time it was very like, I want this now. You should give it to me. Mm-hmm. And then I would. It really skewed my sense of mm-hmm. sex and do you want sex? Do you like sex? How do you say no if you don't want it? You know, because mm-hmm. yeah. you feel obliged because yeah. that person will be mad if you don't do it. It's just been so so amazing to kind of embrace my queerness and see what other types of relationships can exist and what other kind of sex can exist besides yeah. what I was used to because it's yeah. so different. That was a big piece for me to like beyond just feeling like I wouldn't be accepted in the community. It was also like I had a lot of sexual trauma with men feeling like you have to do certain things just for their pleasure even though like yeah. you're not actually enjoying yourself. Yeah. Going into like a woman loving woman relationship I was like whoa we don't have to do any of the parts I don't like. I mean I can't speak to for anybody but yeah. Like for me, it's like, I don't want you to do it if you don't want to exactly. do it. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. insane. Then I'm not having or, fun. Or if you were doing right? it, and yeah. you could probably sense, like, yeah. I don't think you want to be doing this. Yeah. Right. Because like, you're, like, emotionally right. intelligent, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm, <laughs> I can yeah. sense that you aren't <laughs> here right now. That's the part, though, of first queering those other relationships, too, yeah. because that has been yes, a massive true. part of, like, healing my relationship to men is mm. realizing just because you have a dick and it's hard right now doesn't mean I have to do anything with yeah. it. You know? Because yeah. yeah. that yeah. was true. a huge yes. fucking part of it. It feels like an obligation. Yeah. Yes. I would wake up with a boner against my back and I would go, oh, Fuck. great. Yeah. Well, now I have to deal with this. <laughs> I have to deal with so this. You, you, but you don't. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. When I think of sometimes like, yeah. oh, when I wake up in the morning, I have like trauma where I'm like, Oof. oh, my like arch my back to make sure nothing's touching it. <laughs> well, like, yeah, I have like literally true. like yeah. physical yeah. Like, nightmares. The nice thing is, is like you can find queer men that exist. There are men who are also like trauma informed too, yeah. which mm-hmm. is like the lovely thing that I found. Cause like, yeah. I didn't see myself ever being in a relationship with a man until yeah. like I met someone who is respectful of all those things that is like attentive as well and I'm mm-hmm. like okay both of these things exist in both relationships and that can exist and I think it's understanding consent like what that looks like mm. it's mm-hmm. stopping when like things don't feel good for yourself anymore because yeah. like continuing doesn't feel nice no mm-hmm. yeah. no, it feels good. a betrayal to your body which yeah. stays with you you take all of that information in and then with your queer relationships you're like I never want this to be a thing yes yeah. like mm. this is what we're not doing true yeah. so. <laughs> true yeah. 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 It, it feels like incredibly liberating and exciting and I think that's mm-hmm. what can make you think like I'm a lesbian now because like this is so True. drastically better yeah. but it's actually those weird parts of the relationship that were making it not good and like that doesn't have to be tied to yeah. an AMAB person's body yeah. you know what I mean yeah. that also puts yeah. them in a box that's how they were socialized unfortunately and a lot of mm-hmm. men continue yes. to be socialized and unfortunately do still do that yeah. for sure. which is a challenge for sure. I feel like yeah. for a lot of men again socially with what we've taught them we've taught them that for them to feel intimacy they have to like have sex mm. and that's not the only way to feel intimacy either. yes yeah yes and exactly. that's weak to like experience sensuality yes. and intimacy yeah yes mm. i remember really trying to express to my ex that like i respond like foreplay to me is like a genuine hug it's not a hug with intention mm-hmm. and foreplay yeah. also doesn't start in the bedroom it's the way that you're treating oh your partner God, throughout yes. the day your whole mm. relationship it's like that is make what's me coffee <laughs> i'll do stuff with you, yeah. you know? I'll do i want stuff. to yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Eva, I'm wondering, we've kind of like meandered and discussed a lot of the different challenges that are experienced by late bloomers, but I'm wondering if there's any that we've missed mm. that you'd be able to bring up. Ooh, so many. I think I talked a little bit about like feeling alone. Maybe if you're a late bloomer and you don't surround yourself with queer people and then yeah. you realize like, oh, I'm queer. You're like, my straight friends have no sense of relating to my experience. And right. a lot of queer people who've maybe been in the community for a while also can't relate or understand your mm. experience. Mm. And if you 
haven't already built up like a queer community around you before you come out, Mm -hmm. it can be like a really big life transition to be like, okay, (laughs) like what does a queer life look like? What would you suggest to late bloomers who are struggling with feeling alone and trying to find community? What are ways to kind of seek community and feel like less alone? I created like a late bloomer support club basically Mm -hmm. for people who, yeah, because sometimes it can feel overwhelming to go into the queer community when you're like, I just got here. So having spaces where you don't have to have all the answers. Mm. I also have the space online, which I feel like can be a lot less Mm. intimidating than Mm. like going in person. Like people can Mm. meet online? Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. This is good because I feel like if people ask me what you suggest, I'm going to be like, Eva. I feel like there are queer groups for every hobby, something you already know that you enjoy and like love to be a part of. You can find that in like Mm -hmm. a chill way and find queer community. You don't have Mm -hmm. to like go clubbing. Like you can go to queer run club. You can go Mm -hmm. to like queer stitch club. Like that's that's true. They all exist. Something for everyone. I'm wondering if you have advice for people who are feeling like they're not queer enough to come out right now. I feel like we've woven so many affirmations throughout Mm -hmm. this, Mm -hmm. but realizing that you don't need receipts, that queerness is about your personal identity, Mm -hmm. not about having actions or evidence, knowing that like you will feel more grounded in your identity and more confident as time goes on. If you feel like I'm new here, like I've never seen any of the L word, I've never watched any drag (laughs) race, like the more time you spend in the queer community, the more you'll have a sense of what's going on and yeah. <laughs> it's okay to like give yourself permission mm-hmm. to feel new and then feel more confident as time goes on. This next section that I want to get into is really <gasps> about managing our first queer experiences mm-hmm. and that's on like the romantic and the sexual side because it can be overwhelming in so many different regards yeah. but I find there's a real phenomenon that happens to folks who are newly exploring their queerness where you may have a few lackluster experiences and like awkward first sexual experiences mm-hmm. but once you find someone who you have chemistry with you're obsession and attachment to them can be like very overwhelming and I'm wondering Eva if you've like seen or experienced this in the people you've worked with or in your own life and like why you believe this happens yeah I've definitely experienced this Mm -hmm. for real and I think it really ties back to something you said about like when you're moving from like a community of just straight people Mm -hmm. into maybe feeling alone and really like Mm -hmm. looking for queer connection oftentimes part of that like initial queer connection is maybe finding a romantic part Partner. And when that is the only or maybe out of the few queer people in your mm-hmm. life who truly gets you and makes you feel seen on like that deeper level yeah. in that moment where you're so longing for validation and community, it's so easy for that to take on a mm-hmm. real deeper intensity where you're mm-hmm. like, I need this person so that I feel seen and that I feel safe. Yeah. And it can create kind of like a power imbalance. And there are some people out here who will use that mm-hmm. to manipulate you or to like take mm-hmm. advantage of you. I think too, it can be be such an exciting experience to like yeah. finally get to do this thing that you've been dreaming about for so long and yeah. then you finally also it's like connecting to it's like you find someone you have chemistry with yeah. and you've wanted to do it forever it's yeah. like whoa this is mind blowing <laughs> but then it does make you ignore red flags in a relationship I'd say that about some past relationships mm. I've had D- ditto. where <laughs> it's like that person gave you your sexual awakening in yeah. some ways it's about reframing that like some things I would want to go back and like tell that person because it kind of goes to the point when that breakup's happening you're like I'm gonna fucking kill myself because you're like you are everything to me like you're my awakening Mm -hmm. you're the person who helps me like signal that I'm queer it's Mm -hmm. like it's so much is tied to that Mm -hmm. but what's an important thing that you said is like maintaining your sense of self throughout that relationship Mm -hmm. and continuing to build your queerness on your own I think okay I'll end it with like a warning note I was gonna give the people a warning yeah (laughs) okay so for me your first woman on woman or sapphic experience mm. sapphic relationship or mm. love will feel so intense mm. you gotta like remember to keep checking in on yourself am I experiencing any toxicity mm-hmm. am I ignoring red flags mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. boundaries being crossed mm-hmm. am I obsessing a little bit too much am I too attached when this person does this thing or has this emotional reaction does mm-hmm. my entire emotional reaction and like yeah. inner yeah. self like change because I'm like so obsessed with this person because Mm -hmm. I have experienced that for sure and it rocks your entire world Mm -hmm. especially when you Mm -hmm. allow that to happen without Mm -hmm. checking anything and then you break up and then you're like I'm gonna die yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. so I think it's the checking too like are you constantly scared of losing them you shouldn't feel like your whole world is going to end if you lose that person I think like checking in with friends too again it can be such an isolating time Mm -hmm. where you're like do I have queer friends that like Mm -hmm. I can be really 
really real with. And like if you've just come out, you don't want to tell somebody like a negative queer experience that you're having Mm, because then they might be like, well, maybe not you're not queer. Maybe like you should break up. I wish like in those experiences that I had been really real with friends about Mm. the ways that things had been toxic or the ways that things have been hurtful. A lot of the time you don't want like your friends to get a bad impression of this person. But if at the time I was telling my friends, oh, this person did this. That's how they reacted to fight. Someone would be like, that sounds abusive. Yeah. You know, that sounds emotionally abusive. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it took for me to like take so many months to then be like, okay, so here's what's really happening. And they'd be like, baby girl, we got to get you out of there. Plug. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Ralph, I'm wondering what your like first queer love experience has been like. Is Jamie your first queer love? Yeah, for sure. (gasps) How do you feel in your relationship now, this being your first queer love that you're currently experiencing? Do you think maybe like age comes into play too? Like I think you have a strong sense of self rather than I was probably like 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't really have your sense of self at that point. So yeah. So your experience. Because I spend my entire life single and then kind of casually dating and dating so many different types of people and like really getting to know myself throughout that. Mm -hmm. I think entering this relationship with Jamie, I know what my non-negotiables are. I've made a list with my friend a couple years ago. I know what my boundaries are. I know how to communicate. I know like my downfalls and Mm -hmm. I can express those to people. You know, when I see myself doing something, I can be like, see myself doing it. I'm really sorry. This is my tendency to do this and this is why. And I think that just helps make for a strong relationship. There's the other side of this experience that we were talking about where your first one, it's like built up and then it ends up being lackluster and you're like, am I? Okay. Yeah. Do I even like this? Yeah. And you're questioning yeah. yourself. Eva, how do we balance this? Like, how do you manage your expectations? <laughs> because like we said in the beginning, like not every person you're going to have chemistry with. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. exactly what it is for me. Like yeah. the first time I <laughs> hooked up with my roommate. Classic. Yeah. classic. Love to see it. It was a similar yeah. experience. Where, yeah, like, that's we, messy. We, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it would have been messy yeah. for better, for worse. Mm-hmm. She came down the night before and was like, actually, I think I'm going to get back together with my boyfriend. And like, that was fun. But like, oh. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> You're like, so it was that good, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I really, <laughs> twisted I, really your mind. I did feel the thing where I was like, if I was queer, it would have been like this life changing experience. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, it just felt like having casual sex. Mm-hmm. Like right, I've yeah. had casual sex, like it was fun, yeah. like a cute little time. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel romantic attraction to you. But that doesn't yeah. mean I'm not queer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's important mm-hmm. to check in with yourself. Think back to your past hookup experiences. Yeah, mm-hmm. were they all amazing? No, a lot of them were awkward. And you bad. like lose perspective <laughs> of the fact yeah. that like yeah. in your past you <laughs> kissed people and been like oh yeah. I hate it. Like, that. Oh, that was really or bad. Or nothing. Yeah. Or like you know when you yeah. like someone and you're like so excited <laughs> and then when you finally hook up it's and you, nothing's there. You're like oh what the hell? Yeah. Like that's mm-hmm. just people. Yeah. You know? Like our mm-hmm. bodies just didn't uh, mesh. Yeah. yeah. The puzzle pieces straight. aren't fitting. Also I will say <laughs> this is an okay story to tell because yeah. me and Jamie joke about it but yeah. when me and Jamie like first met on Hinge we talked for so long classic sending like voice notes every yeah. night. So many voice notes. We messaged for so long. Damn still on the app too. On the app and then we transitioned to Instagram and also I saw that she the number yet. saw that she <laughs> followed me already and had sent yeah. me a message like six months prior and I was like so you do know who I am and she was like to be fair I know one song what was the message it was about I was looking for a therapist uh, oh she's oh, like okay. here's a wreck and she was like here's a wreck so it was very oh, nice okay. but we, we talked <laughs> for so long and then when we finally met up I was going to LA for six weeks so we like hooked up once or twice and then I went to LA and we like would FaceTime all the time and talk all the time and I wasn't hooking up with anyone or dating at all in LA I felt like emotionally tied to her. So she was going to see her grandma in Vancouver and she was like, when you're coming back from LA, instead of going to Toronto, do you want to meet me in Vancouver? And mm-hmm. like, we can have like two days with my grandma. So but, gay. So, so gay. I know. And I love family. Yeah. So I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to get to Vancouver. It's going to be makeouts. It's going to be closed off. So I get to the airport and she comes to pick me up and it is an awkward mm-hmm. quick hug. And I was like, oh, hello? Like, yeah. nice mm-hmm. to see you. <laughs> yeah. It just felt awkward. The nerves mm-hmm. had and built then, it up. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. then like for sign in the hotel room, the sexy connect is like not really there. So yeah. we're like trying yeah. to kiss, and it's yeah. not really working. And then the next mm-hmm. night, we do not kiss at all because in my mm-hmm. mind, I'm like we're friends. Uh-oh. Like, yeah, you know, because mm-hmm. this is the thing. I'm also yeah. so used to like having best girlfriends mm-hmm. right. that I was like, that's what we are. We yeah. hooked up in the past. Yeah, that was good, but maybe we talked too much. Yeah, and now we're just yeah. girlfriends, and yeah. neither of us can imagine each other naked. So <laughs> that weekend was not good. How'd you um, recover? It? How'd you recover? <laughs> <laughs> I invited her to my farmhouse with my family. Up More north. family. Uh, you have and a she trend. said, yes, let's go. But can we go to Aurora so you can meet my family? Because I have to go for my. So wow. in my mind, I was also like, I think we're, this is the conversation that we're going to have where we like decide to be friends. But on the way and there, we stopped friends. at her family gathering <laughs> and then went to my farm with my parents. 
and then in we were sharing a bed, and mm-hmm. when we turned off the Only lights, it bed. was like one bed. When we turned just oh, one, and my the dad, Lord. The Lord. Yeah. The Lord. <laughs> when the when the lights go the out, it's is like sexy. I know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like pitch dark. And mm. I remember saying to her, "Can you see my hand in front of your face?" And she's like, "No." And mm. I was like, "Really?" She's like, "No, not at all." I think in the dark, <laughs> we had the courage to Aww. have this awkward conversation yeah. where I was like, yeah. "I really like you, but I think." Maybe you think it's friend. And she was like, oh my God, are you fucking kidding me? I think you're so hot. That is crazy that you don't think I'm attracted to you. She was like, I don't think you're attracted to me. And I was like, wait, no, what? Like, no. And then we hooked up and that was like my first like hookup. I think we had heated makeouts before I'd left for LA, Mm -hmm. but that was like in the dark, this like proper hookup. And it was so nice because I'd gone into it being like, oh, there's no chemistry. And then like freaking flip it around and we're like hooking up with my parents in the room next to us, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think just to maintain that sometimes just wires get crossed yeah. and, and you kind of have to like yeah. have the courageous conversation and work through it. And then sometimes it is maybe just a friend vibe. Yeah. yeah. My question for Eva, mm-hmm. another one for you is so there's maybe some people who are listening to this who have like zero mm-hmm. sexual experience with like same sex partners. Mm-hmm. And what would your advice be for that? Because that is nerve wracking. Yeah. I would say that like you know more than you think you do. Like it seems like this mystical like, oh, it's going to be so different. Like. I'm not going to know, but like making out feels yeah. similar to yeah. no matter gender. feels the same. Grinding feels the same. You maybe have boobs. The other mm. person maybe has boobs. Somewhere to start. The knee thing, if you don't know what it is. Oh, just, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> just try putting yeah. parts in different places. Uh-huh. <laughs> the knee thing, let's just say a lot can come from a knee. Yeah. You know? A lot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, have somebody saying. grind against your knees. A lot of, it's good pressure. But yeah, like you don't, there's no pressure to like take yeah. clothes off your first time. It's also okay to like ask mm. somebody what feels good. Yeah. Like it is hot to be like, mm. what would make you feel really good right what now? Do you like? what do you yeah. Like? yeah, what turns you on? Mm. Yeah. And it's okay for it not mm. to be perfect. It's okay for there to be like laughter. Yeah. I feel like with sapphic True. intimacy, mm. there's like so much more allowance yeah. for like, let's take snack breaks. Let's mm. like yeah. have a little snack giggle. Break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like the cat is suddenly in the room and you're like oh my yes. god we gotta move the cat yeah, the moment isn't lost yeah, yeah. yeah. there's an interruption yeah. moving yeah. the cat is like the gayest thing I've ever heard it is it's like constant like- <laughs> so this episode's coming out around pride season and I think especially with people who are new to coming out there can be a lot of pressure For around sure. pride it's like all of these fears start coming up so Eva how do we navigate our first prides I think yeah releasing expectations <laughs> there can be this need to be like I need to check off and like do everything mm. but this is not going to be your last pride mm-hmm and there's an, it's not going to be your mm-hmm. last chance to be gay Maybe. throughout the year. That's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> it is a threat. Maybe it's going to be your last I'm going to make sure it's your last ride. <laughs> but yeah, like mm-hmm. you're going to have more fun if you like release yourself of this expectation yeah. mm-hmm. and just like yeah. let yourself go with the flow a little mm-hmm. bit. There are low key events that yeah. you can go to. Park. Mm-hmm. There's a big park picnic yes, hang park at Christie Pits. Picnic. It's really yeah. cash. Mm-hmm. Great place to meet people in the community too. You know, on what you were saying, mm-hmm. like there's always going to be more prides mm-hmm. and yeah. it doesn't mean that you're not queer enough just because you don't want to go to Church Street at mm-hmm. 1 a.m. Yeah. You know, like you can be queer and yeah. you can go to bed at 10 yeah. during also, Pride. Yeah. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Church Street at 1 a.m. is overwhelming. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't need to be there at all. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, totally. I will also say that when it comes to like your first Pride especially, I had built it up in my head, especially if you're from mm-hmm. out of town, yeah. mm-hmm. that you're gonna get into the city and it's gonna be the most <laughs> yeah. magical yeah. queer yeah. experience of your entire life mm-hmm. and your life is gonna change and you're gonna enter this metamorphosis mm-hmm. and enlightenment and you're like, wow, <laughs> I'll never be the same. Did it's, that happen? No. <laughs> Did it, did it feel like lackluster? Like, were you I like, I was like, this is was fine. <laughs> yeah. Queer people for sure. Yeah. But I don't know. I had built it up in my head that mm. I was like, I was going to enter and people were yeah. going to like surround me. Wow. Yes. They were going to flock to me and they're like, here's my number. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. And I was like, this is it. Like, yeah. I'm ready. My pockets yeah. are empty and yeah. ready for your numbers. Wow. Like, I had seen somebody's story of like, how did I end up with like all these girls' numbers in my pockets? Like, they wrote okay. their number down yeah. wow. and put it in her pocket. And she didn't know that that was happening and I was like this is gonna happen to me this is me yeah yes. that's like I am. so I was like pockets and then I would go home and I'd be like yeah they're empty fuck like what is it <laughs> 
your expectation <laughs> of pride was really I'm specific. Obsessed. Yeah, that's so, so specific. specific. <laughs> but like when you hear it, when all you hear is other people's stories yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they're very specific stories, for I'm sure. like, yeah. that's me. Mm. I will say like my experience of pride for the first few times and still to this day is like still really great. Like I still love yeah. being surrounded by community. Like yeah. that's still a beautiful thing. Being around people that you know are all at least allies or people mm-hmm. who are queer. It's so beautiful and like dancing together, doing all of these things. That is really nice. As long as you're not putting expectations of like hooking up with people. Yeah. Like you don't know if you're going to meet people. But like you will like experience beautiful human queer connection, you know, yeah. which is like a really nice part of going to Pride. And I mean, <laughs> I think that's a great place for us to end this yeah. off. But what I wanted to ask you both is if you have anything on the go that you want to plug to our listeners. I am playing Pride in Cape Breton in Amazing. June. It's called Ingo Pride. And I'm playing with Rev and Rhea May and Lemon. We're all awesome. friends that I've yeah. toured with or been mm-hmm. on Drag Race with. And then I'm also playing another Pride, which has not been announced. So I guess I can't say what it is. It's mm. not Toronto. I'll say that. Uh, that application got denied. Yeah. <laughs> Come um, on, but it together. is another city in Canada that may or may not be the capital. And I've been yeah. writing a TV show for the last year. Whoa. I directed yeah. and edited and produced the last three videos that I did and have been doing more creative direction for other people in songwriting. So yeah, I'm mm-hmm. excited to continue to expand as an artist and like mm-hmm. feel confident in being like, I can do all of these things, you know? Oh yeah. Eva, <laughs> what do you have? to plug for us. <laughs> yeah. um, I talked a little bit about the Late Bloomers Club before. Mm-hmm. That is ongoing. It's called the Fuck Compet Support Club. Mm-hmm. We meet monthly on Zoom and have an amazing Discord. So if you want kind of support over Pride to be like, baby's first Pride, mm-hmm. any advice, or just like talk to people who get it, that is available. I also am running something called Spicy Sapphic Summer, which is about like building confidence around queer dating. It'll probably be in its last couple sessions by the time this comes out, mm-hmm. but it will be available to buy as a little package. Cool. So if you want cool. some queer sex ed and yeah. dating, how to flirt with queer babes, Oof. that'll be there. Oof. And we, we, we could all use we that. We could all <laughs> use that. We're all learning. <laughs> yeah. So that's everything that we have for you today. And if you want to dive deeper into more comprehensive sex ed, we have a lovely episode with Eva Bloom that will be the first link in the description or you can click the video on the left. And if you like the podcast and you want to help us out, we would really love for you to leave us a review because it really does help the podcast out and we love reading them. Make sure to leave a like, comment and subscribe because it really does help the podcast out. That's everything that we got. And until next time, (gasps) peace. peace.